Okay. okay. So uh, we'll introduce myself first. My name is Dave Grant. I am the acting uh, chief of procurement at FEMA over in DHS. Uh, and we have a panel here. We're going to introduce uh, a whole bunch of folks here in a second. But let me tell you why we're here with one clear distinction. Uh, this panel is called Exposing the Truth, Relationship Between Protests and Debriefings. And it's really about um, the debriefing process. How do you make the decision to have a debriefing? What kind of, of decision do you have? And when you're on the corporate side, uh, how do you approach it? Um, we did think about, you know, we always get questions about uh, protests and debriefings, and, and we can have, all of us could stand up here and tell you stories about our experiences with it, and we decided to try something a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna have a skit from a Swedish firm and a Swedish contracting shop. Uh, so Sven and everyone will, is gonna be here, we're gonna get into our characters, and we're gonna try and take you inside inside the thinking of, uh, of these processes. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, the Academy Awards will be handed out during the session afterwards. Okay, so uh, Tiffany Taylor is, is right down here, please stand. Tiffany is the Assistant Director at USDA Forest Service Acquisition Management. Um, she, uh, prior to her current position, she developed and managed the acquisition savings plan for the Forest Service. Uh, we're lucky to have her. Uh, you're gonna enjoy her character as well. <laughs> Uh, Brian, stand up please. Brian uh, Kendrick is the Vice President at Terracor. He's led Terracor strategic planning, growth uh, strategy, and client services since 2005. So uh, we're, we really tried to have on our panel both government and um, contractor side so we can uh, maybe learn some of the ins and outs of how this goes. Um, Lori Stoller, please stand right here. Uh, Lori serves as the Vice President of Business Development for URS Federal Systems Engineering and Information Solutions Group. She manages a team of business development professionals focused on assisting government across the federal uh, civilian and defense markets. Okay, and now we have Michael Palmer right here. Uh, Michael leads the acquisition activities for the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Cybersecurity and Communication, managing a portfolio of cybersecurity contracts valued over a billion dollars. And uh, frankly, the best name on the panel, because she shares my last name, is Lisa Grant. Uh, she is the Acting Assistant Commissioner for Office of Acquisition Management at GSA, having over 25 years of experience with multiple uh, federal agencies. Uh, we also have uh, Lou Chirella, standing right down, sitting right down here. Lou is an attorney for the Procurement Law Division for the General Counsel, U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, has been there since 2001. I could read you the rest of his bio, but it would put all of us to shame, so we're not going to do that. Um, he's got a ton of legal experience, which is going to be helpful as well. So, with that introduction, we want to get into our serious acting roles, so let me tell you a little bit about it. One of the things you're going to see uh, probably after is a series of what we hope are more thought-provoking questions. Um, interestingly, I read an article just this past week in one of the trade magazines, I forget which one, saying how boring these panels are and they wish panels could really just engage with audiences. I forget, if anyone remembers where it was either FCW or government executive, I forget. So uh, the burden's now, I'm transferring the burden to you. Um, we are going to put some thoughts up here for you to think about asking us. Uh, Tanaz and others are going to have microphones and if somebody has a question, uh, please engage us. We have a lot of experience with these panel members here, and we'd like to learn from you as well as uh, tell you some of our thoughts. So please engage us with questions and make that Q&A process uh, very, uh, uh, very engaging for both of us. So let me introduce uh, to you the first skit, okay? Uh, we have two skits coming. The first one, we're gonna bring you inside the government, Swedish government uh, office. Uh, who is just awarding a large $500 million, very competitive procurement. There are 20 bidders, obviously one winner, 19 um, losing offers. It's been a long process, well over a year, probably close to two. We don't like to admit that in Sweden. Um, these companies have spent lots of money, hundreds of thousands, maybe over a million dollars in bid and proposal cost. So it's it's, uh, we have an incumbent involved, we have lots of other subcontractors involved, we have lots of uh, folks from industry here involved. Uh, we need to decide in this government conference room, in this secret room, 
how much information we're willing to share, how much candidature should we have at debriefing, what the thought process is that goes into that. So in here, we're going to have the contracting officer, Mike Palmer, AKA Sven. <laughs> we have the director of procurement, Brian Kendrick, AKA Boris. We have the program manager, Lisa Grant, AKA Ragna. And we have in-house counsel, uh, AKA Sylvester. So I'm gonna turn this off, pick up my microphone, and we're going to head over here, and in about 10 seconds, the acting will begin. The, light, the light's dim. <laughs> Wow, that was a long process. I'm glad Ooh. I see the, yeah. Lights at the end of the tunnel. Lights are on. Lights are at the end of the tunnel. I'm glad we finally got to award. Hallelujah. Now, we need to decide what we're gonna do in terms of uh, information to these 19 offerers that did not win, as well as possibly to the winning awardee. So, uh, I think we should send out letters, and that will suffice. Let's just do that. I, I don't have a lot of time for all this. I gotta go. What does everybody think about that? Well, well, you know, for the first time ever, a program manager will agree with a contract. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's good. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, good meeting. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not so fast, then. Ragna. I know, I know this is taking a long time. Goodness knows, we did the industry day a year and a half ago, right? And we did the draft RFP. We've been through a long, drawn-out process. So we spent enough time with the office. That's, that's right. All right. That is one way to look at it. But wait a minute, Sven. Wait just a second. All right. Part of our issue here is we've known a lot of these contractors for an awful long time. They do other things with us. You know, we have existing relationships. Oh, they'll be back. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't be all known. Don't be all known. But, but we still, I think because of those relationships, all the conversations that we've had, the meeting after meeting that we've had, we owe it to them. We owe it to them to tell them a bit more. We can't just send them the standard email, you know, saying thank you very much for participating. This has got to be a little bit more than that. Well, we could. We need oral viewers. Oh. Okay. Couple, all right, let's couple, talk about it. Couple, couple of questions here. Do we have any difficult relationships with any of these with these contractors? Well, a couple of them did call up and leave some nasty voicemails for me. Uh, and in the past, a couple of them have caused us some challenges. So, yes, I would Sven, say Sven let, let me say, I think we better be careful here. With, with 19 upset offers, the likelihood of a protest is significant. So it sounds like you're agreeing. No oral debris. We're well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Just a second, Sven. Just a second. I'm not saying that. Product, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we better be careful about the information we give them and how we give it to them and make sure that we reduce our protest risk to the maximum extent possible. Let's keep it short, sweet, generic, and don't put ourselves out there. Because Sven, you know, sometimes some of the debriefings I've witnessed, you tend to get off track and start to tell them everything in the world you think of. This is not the point where we want to get off script. You're right. Uh, so what do you think about, so what information should we share? Um, because, you know, there's a high risk. 19 offers, 20 offers. What do you think right now? Well, well first of all, it's March Madness, and you all are really wasting my time. <laughs> but, um... Who do you have in the pool, by the way, at the United States tournament? If, if we're going to give them oral debriefing, then we need to take a look at the evaluation plan and the source selection report that was written. And we need to take that information verbatim from both of those documents and provide it to the office so they have a clear understanding of how the government evaluated their proposal. We cannot deviate from that at all. I would like to have those documents routed through our office prior to anything being finalized so we can do a sanity check and make sure that we're being consistent. Well, that, that sounds like, you're, are you thinking we should have a script for this? 
I think that's a good idea, because you know how Sven can get off topic. <laughs> listen, listen, at, at what point are we going to practice the kick under the table for, for you and me, in case one of us describe, starts to go up? So that's a good question. Do you think that any of these uh, contractors will be bringing their own counsel? Well, they did leave those voicemails. <laughs> I would say yes. I, I think a couple of them will. Protested I think in, in that case, in those companies, then Protested. someone from my staff absolutely needs to be there. So we need to make sure we get a list of the attendees mm -hmm. from the contractor side in the debriefing. And if we see that their legal counsel is attending, then we will invite your office to attend. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I hate to ask this question, Sven, but do we know the protest history? Is, is Offer A part of this? Those guys protest every time. Yes. A is one of the voicemails. <laughs> so, so yes, A is in the mix, so uh, they definitely will be. So we don't worry about uh, As well as the incumbent, because they didn't win. Oh, you know that game. You know what those contractors do when they're the incumbent? Right. They think they own the, the program. Well, I think given, given that, I think the other track that you need to be thinking about is what happens when, when and if we get a protest, how do you keep the existing contract in place, how do you keep, um, keep the program in motion given the delay? Yeah, so as a, as a contracting shop, I don't know how we're going to manage on the workload. I mean, because the amount of preparation for each of these, I, my contracting specialist, is, her, his head's going to explode. I mean, if, if I give him this. 19 degree, 20 potentially, if the awardee wants. Well, I'll tell you um, what we'll do. Maybe we should skip the preparation. Oh, Let's no, just go no, no, right no, there. That, that's 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 right. 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 We can't skip. Yeah. Very good. What, what we will do is, I'll, I'll dedicate a couple of people from my staff who will take a look at the uh, source selection document since we drafted it and, and create the uh, script that we'll use for each of the offers. And then we'll send it to, to you and to legal counsel to take a look at and make sure that it mirrors all of the documents. And I suggest we have at least a dry run for each offerer before <coughs> you bring them in. So it's really running not 20, but 40. <laughs> so, all right, all right. That's, that's devastating. I, I know that's a lot. You got a lot on your plate. I put a lot of that on your plate. But I think if, we, if I take a look, I can redeploy a few people. Thor's almost done with that life-saving thing he's got going on in New York City. I think we can redeploy Hans. We can make this work. The God of Thunder would definitely help this effort. <laughs> Tell him to bring his hammer. <laughs> All right, well, it sounds like we have a plan. I'm, I'm ready to go. Got superheroes on board. Let's do it. So we'll get you something next week. Okay, done. So, skit two, same scenario. $500 million competitive procurement. It's been out there for, as you heard, our former director of procurement. Um, I forget his name. Let me go back. Was it? Sven. Sven? Boris. No. Boris. Boris. Boris said we've been out there for 18 months. Now we're going to go into company A. And we're going to find out how they learned that they didn't win this award. And we're going to find out how they make the decision how to approach um, the government after receiving this news. So we're going to turn right now to our team. We have Tiffany Taylor playing Frida, the CEO, off stage. She'll be exit. She'll be entering in a moment. We have Brian as Boris again, VP of Operations. Then we have our Vice President of Business Development and Capture. Uh, Lori is playing Helga, and then I will play the role of contracts director, Olaf, and here we go. You have mail. Oh, there's an email from the contracting officer in our large strategic bid. I'm so excited. This must be good news. Dear Helga, thank you for your proposal submission. We found that your company's response thoroughly addressed all aspects in the RFP. This is really good so far. There were many strengths within your offering that we've highlighted. Six major strengths include the following. Technical approach, management approach, staffing plan, flexibility was demonstrated, teaming in small business and contracting, proven delivery. We also found that your price proposal was reasonable. This sounds great, it sounds like we won. 
we, re we regret to inform you that the award of this large strategic program was made to ABC Services. The evaluation ratings are listed below for your reference. We hope that your company continues to pursue doing business with our agency. Sincerely, the contracting officer. This sounded like an award notice. This is awful. Oh my gosh. Honey, you know that vacation we had planned? You have to cancel it. We can't go. We lost the big deal. And oh, go catch my bonus check. I have to go tell Frida we lost. <laughs> How am I going to tell Frida and the team that we lost this bid? Dum, 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 dum. Helga, what happened? Frida. You told me that this was in the bag. We had this covered. Our business development team was out there <laughs> engaging with the customer. We were all over it. We knew what the customer wanted. We had a great capture strategy. No, I, 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 I'm tired of hearing excuses. We spent so much money on this proposal. I mean, we had boxes and boxes and people spent lots of time and lots of money on trying to get this. You told me we were going to get it. You know what? We had it. I'll tell you, though, a couple things happened, and you guys know I brought it to your attention. We had one of our key customers left the agency. A new person came in. We did not. We were not able to be able to get to them. The RFP was out. They wouldn't meet with us. That could be a reason. Maybe that person was a key decision maker. <coughs> I don't care. We did everything right on this, Frida. We knew the org chart, we knew people at the top, people in the middle, people at the bottom. We knew the incumbents, we talked to the contracting people, we talked to other people in industry. I quite frankly don't understand how this happened. <laughs> about that, Helga. We pulled our best people in from all across the country on this one. We were laser focused. No one had a better agile-based, mobility, big data, cyber focused solution. <laughs> You know, I agree with that. I have to agree with Boris. And, you know, if you guys recall, when we first got the RFP, it was really hard for us to distinguish between the evaluation criteria that we saw in L and Section L and M and in the SUE. And we struggled over that for a long time. So, how many people did you guys have on this? How, how is your team going to be impacted now that. Oh, I have to tell you, that's a serious problem, both from our partners and from our, our own standpoint. The South Division, that contract was ending next month. We were bringing 200 people onto this contract. I don't know what we're going to do with them now. And then we had 400 more we were pipelining to get ready. This was a big thing for us. We haven't made any offers, have we? We haven't brought anybody on board for this? Well, unfortunately, we have made, because this is the program that they wanted to hit the ground running, we have made tentative offers to about a third of those people. And let's not forget the subcontract agreements that we have. Um, we're going to get a lot of pressure on this from both angles. So, has, has well, anybody well, told Frida, us yet? I got to tell you, you know, XYZ company, our major sub, they're going to push us to protest. They spent about as much money as we did on this bid. I, I, I mean, is, is that the only way to do that? I mean, you know, I just bought a new house. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we can't afford to waste all this money on this proposal and go do a protest. What's that going to cost us? Well, I've, I've taken a look at the letter that came in. Typical government contracting officer didn't tell us a thing. Very generic, your proposal was fine, everything was fine, 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 fine. We didn't win, we don't know why. So I think we should request a debriefing. Probably they're only gonna offer some letter. We need, we need it in person, we need to push for that. But I'll tell you, we've dealt with this agency before. We go in there, we just get bland, fine, bland, fine. We never get any good information. If, you, if they would just tell us what the difference was between what they wanted and what they got from us, it would help. I don't think we're going to get it. We may. Who do we know on the inside? Well, Ralph left. He, he, was, he was the person that, that had seen us work before and knows how good we were. You know, I'm not advocating um, protesting because you know the cost. We're going to have to bring in Zurich and company to the outside law firm. They're not cheap. But it depends on, and, and don't forget the other we did on another project. Well, we've got some upcoming too. And we have with two them, more, so one we... with the same customer. Yeah. I, I feel oh, like you, I, is that, what's that going to do to us? I feel like I've sat in a contracting officer's chair before. And so, <laughs> as I think through this, I, I think.
think that's going to damage our relationship. I don't think it's a good idea. So, all right, I want you guys to figure out, put together what the risks are if we decide to protest. Um, find out about the debriefs, whether or not we even have a position, and don't even think that this is going to be the end of it because you guys are all up for, you know, renewals on your contracts. You know, your. Well, Frida, I have something that I think will help, at least just for the short term. But if we go and just crack open this bottle of vodka, we can go talk and think about it. <laughs> all right, I like that plan. <laughs> One of the things we want you to think about, and we really would like to get some feedback, so please uh, don't hesitate at all to, uh, uh, to jump in. Um, one of the questions we'd like to ask you as the audience is, what do you consider a successful debriefing? We have about, in this conference, about half government, half industry, so that answer could be different for each one of you depending on your perspective. But it's one of the things we'd like to think about is, what is a successful debriefing? Because that will color the kind of conversations that just occur. And what is your goal to come out of it? So one of the things we want you to think about, and feel free to step up and start asking questions, what is the definition of a successful debriefing to you? Um, so let me let me pose that here to the panel, and we'll try and get a conversation started. Any, any one of you like to step up? What is a successful debriefing from, let's say, a government perspective? So one of our government panel members, what does a successful debriefing mean to you? And Per, if those of you know Jim Williams' standing background, Jim was joking with me earlier, a successful debriefing doesn't mean that it results in a successful protest from the offer. As Jim was saying, now that he's gone to the other side, uh, Jim used to be my boss many years ago. So. Okay, so from a government perspective, what is a successful debriefing? I'll, I'll take that one, um, and I'm gonna say, not going to say it's you know, no fist fights, because that. <laughs> Um, but seriously, I mean, when I go into a debrief, I want to provide the vendor with good information. I want them to feel like they came in, we told them why we picked the awardee and why they weren't chosen. And we also provide them with information about what they could have done to make their proposal better. Um, what I, I want it to be, in, in the ideal world, an open exchange so that that the, uh, the bidder can ask me questions and I don't have to feel like I am being set up for a protest because I can't be honest with you if I'm afraid of you. So well, let, me, let me interrupt and ask a follow-up question to that for the audience. Um, there is a perspective both, uh, I think, from some government personnel and from uh, industry's view of it, and you can see that a little bit in our skit, that one of the motivating factors in a, in the, from the government contracting officer side is to avoid the protest at all costs and therefore give as little information out as possible because the less you give, the less meat that somebody could hook onto. Now, the, have you found, have any of you found that? Is that a common thought process? Or, or if so, how do we avoid it? Well, I'll take that one. I, I would say it's actually the opposite. I would say the intent is to give as much information as possible so that the offeror will know how the government evaluated their proposal. Um, I've never gone into a debriefing, like you said, I've got 25 years of contracting experience. I've never gone into a debriefing saying, oh, I'm trying to avoid a protest. I go in there and say, I need to provide them with as much information as possible so they can understand my process. Um, I'm not withholding information. I'm giving them as much information as possible. And, and I'm really focusing truly on those areas where they might not have been given the highest rating because that's what impacts uh, an overall evaluation. So if they have a satisfactory in an error or if we've given them a weakness for a particular reason, then I like to focus on those areas so they'll know what my thought process was for that uh, weakness. So how about from some of our industry counterparts? Uh, what is your definition of a successful debriefing that you've received, or what are you expecting? Yeah, I'll chime in. I think um, one of the things that we typically look for in industry is that, that it's very, very clear on why we did not win. I mean, industry typically blames itself first before it ever tries to place blame outside of the company. So it, it does the scenario that we kind of played out, right? The finger pointing and all that type of thing. So if it can be really clear on why our technical solution wasn't as good as the as the awardee's technical solution, for instance. But if, there, if it's vague at all, 
then we just start guessing and we start making things up and we start to try to you know, come up with reasons why we think maybe we didn't win and then we think it's not fair. So I think it just needs so, to be sir, clear. Maybe a follow-up question for, again, the industry. Have you attended a, a very well-run debriefing where you got that information or maybe contrast it with one that you, you went to that was really the antithesis of that? Yeah, I'll take that. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we've experienced uh, both of those. Um, the, a briefing that went really well, we got lots of information. I think during the skit, Lisa talked about how you lift things from the evaluation of certain parts that can be shared. And when you can get that kind of information to understand what went really well, um, you're very happy about it. And you also want to hear the flip side, what didn't go so well. The, 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 the debriefings that are very frustrating are the ones where, well, what, what was your score? Um, it was a four. Okay, what does that mean? Um, well, you, you were above average. Well, what does that mean? You need some kind of words or description around it. So there are some folks that won't give you as much, and that's not as valuable. Then you get where uh, Lori just talked about, where it's not helpful, and then you, you mistrust the process. Well, and I'll bring another thing up as well. I mean, I was part of one in the past that when we got the RFP, it was very hard to distinguish whether the customer was looking for a technical solution offering or actually an approach to a technical offering, a technical solution. And, and we had many debates inside the company over just that. Do they want a specific solution that they want us to roll out on day one, or do they want an approach because they don't yet know what the full requirements are, and they want us to kind of build it with them as we go? And so we took the approach to, to go over the approach, and uh, that wasn't it. And so when we got into the tea brief, it, it was like, you didn't provide us a technical solution. And um, well, that was very helpful for us and helped us learn for next time. It would have been much better to be able to have that dialogue up front, um, you know, in the beginning of the process. Lou, well, let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, in your role, obviously a little bit different from the rest of the panel members, what role does the debriefing play if something actually reaches your level? Well, you know, I see the, the protests that people elect to file. I don't see the ones where people uh, decide and make the business decision not to file the protest. But I can tell you this, that you know, what we don't want to see at GAO is a defensive protest, where somebody files a protest to get the information that they should have received in a debriefing. Um, we don't want to see people get, you know, use the debriefing process, excuse me, the protest process, instead of the debriefing process. But let me at the same time go ahead and say that um, a bad debriefing is not a basis on which we will sustain a protest. So, I mean, the, the, the protest, excuse me, the debriefing happens after the award decision has been made. We look at the validity of an award decision. Whether or not you tell somebody everything, you, you, you don't tell some, you know, a, a, an offer everything that they're entitled to receive, or you tell them something inaccurate, has no impact on, it doesn't provide a basis on which we would sustain a protest. We don't police the whole FAR. We look at the award decision and the debriefing, the validity of the debriefing does not, is not a basis on which we would ever sustain a protest. Okay. Can I add something to that? Please do. Um, the, in, in my experience, um, in, def, in preventing or defending or pre a protest, that starts in the pre-solicitation phase. That starts with the development of the requirements. It starts with, with uh, clear and concise guidance. It starts with evaluation criteria that everyone understands. If you, if you put out a solicitation and you receive, as a contracting officer, 300 questions and 200 are about the same issue, then you need to back up because <laughs> there is some ambiguity there that they don't understand. And so it has to start in that, at the debriefing stage it's too late because you've gone through the entire process. And when I talk about uh, lifting uh, information from the source selection plan, you can only do that if you have had training for your technical evaluation board to ensure they know how to evaluate that proposal. And so as contracting officers, you've got to train that evaluation board. This is what we're looking for. This is not what we're looking for. I have seen, even come into evaluation boards where the, the evaluator has written down, oh, this is stupid. I said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you gotta back out of that one. You, 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 you can think it, but you gotta explain to me what's wrong with that approach. So you can't put that, so I think that's Luke, all a part of it. Yeah, that's a good point, Luke. Uh, um, 
in addition to it being too late at the debriefing to say, I thought the RFP was ambiguous, it would be too late then to raise that issue post-award as a protest. I mean, if you think that there's something wrong with the solicitation, you either have to challenge it, um, raise it prior to closing, or you lose it. But I, I will but. say that um, what the government and industry should do is if you do get to that point where you're in the debriefing and, yeah, you didn't raise the point that the solicit, the RFP was not clear, that's a good time to do it. I mean, the government should be learning from the situation during the debrief as well. So, you know, don't be afraid to say, you know, maybe you're L&M. You that, that really goes there. back to the point Lisa made, which is, they didn't know which track to take, the, the strategic vision, this is where we want to go, or the specific solution. That's probably a point in time to say, that should be clear in the RFP. We should know what direction the government wants, and, and, and probably ask that question at debriefing, and then we as the government could, could learn to write that more clearly. All right, we've got some more staged questions, but I want to take a quick time and see, uh, and pose a question to you guys, and hopefully we have a few. So we'll go ahead. Uh, let me, uh, here we go. Speak up. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, there are often general counsel who have a very strong opinion regarding whether oral versus written information should be given. And oftentimes when a company officer is a junior, they rely on the legal counsel for their advice and they do want to avoid protests if possible. I understand that. So it seems like there's a common understanding that oral debriefing is well deserving, we should try to do more, but at the same time, the reality is that there is that dynamic exchange between the two that are very important to deciding because contracting officer, after all, decides which way they want to go, right? I mean, director cannot dictate what should be done. So having said that, I mean, lawyers are really hard to train, and I don't think there are many general counsel people here taking training. We have training one very important general counsel. <laughs> <laughs> so my question has more to do with how do you, I mean, in your skit, general counsel was very easy yeah, we, we tried to bring up in the skit that, that there might be, you know, a little bit of tension. We're obviously not quite ready for prime time on um, <laughs> Saturday Live, but we tried to bring that up. What to do with general counsel who feels, rightfully so, that written debriefing is safer in terms of controlling the message. And Lou, I understand lawyers may possibly only listen to the GAO. So I sure. Um, on, uh, offers are, if it's a FAR Part 15 procurement, or if it's a task order over five million, now you're entitled, in those instances, to a debriefing. You're not entitled to a normal debriefing. Um, so if a contracting officer says, no, I'm not gonna give you an oral, it doesn't violate anything. Um, sometimes unsuccessful offers don't even want a face-to-face <coughs> -face debriefing. They might have to travel quite a ways. They might want it over the phone. They might want it telephonic. I think you should make the debriefing as meaningful as possible. I think face-to-face -face oral debriefings are most meaningful. That's what we try to require. Yeah, we tried to portray that in the skit that ultimately the two issues you brought up that having the oral will generally convey more information, but at the same time the view of the government is typically that it also incurs more risk, and so we, we tried to portray that a little bit. Add something. So back to your original question, which was what are your goals? So me as a program office person that serves on the technical evaluation panel that helps write RFPs, I know I'm going to have to write another RFP, whether it's you know in six months or in a year. So having an oral debrief helps me uh, get feedback from the vendor, assuming that the contract contracting officer will allow it. I make it a best practice to ask the contracting officer if we can have that conversation near the end of the uh, debrief to get feedback on the on the little things in the RFP that we may not realize really impact the proposal process on the industry side. Um, page count, um, other little things in section L and M that, uh, that drive contractors crazy, but we throw in there sometimes at the last minute, not all the time, but sometimes. We have a hand up right over here. Yes, sir. Do you uh, need the? Uh, uh, I've been told by a number of contractors over the years that one of the reasons why they decided to protest is because they didn't get any information regarding uh, weaknesses in their proposal in the, during the debriefing. And they chose the protest route then because it opened up 
the discovery process. And during that discovery process, they got the answers to the questions they had, they would have asked during a debrief. Now, that having been said, I have a follow-on question. There is a, uh, the comment was made that GAO does not like those types of protests, kind of the fishing expedition, but I didn't, I wasn't clear to me what the implications of that were. So, so what? We will, cons we're not an ombudsman. We're not gonna look at the whole procurement and see if it was done perfectly. The only thing we care about are the issues that the protester raises. Understood, but if right. dur during the process, the protester can get access to information which would serve as grounds for a successful protest. And that was not available previously because they didn't get a good debrief. And so you know, um, companies that the reason for protesting is because they didn't get the information they needed. Yeah. And again, not mean to cut you off. Of, that's what we try to portray in, in the skit, that there is a, oftentimes, a reluctance to provide more detailed information because people feel, sometimes, that by providing that, we may trip up on something. When in fact, we as a panel believe the opposite and want to operate in the opposite way, that giving, as Lisa said, factual, relevant, consistent information pulled from the RFP, from the evaluation uh, reports, and giving it directly to, and as, as Brian just said, we're gonna be doing this again, so it's in our best interest to inform. So we're trying to draw that dichotomy out and say that the right answer is to give it, but oftentimes that hasn't been the case. All right, any more questions from the audience before we get it? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I would just say, um, when, when we first started out in the federal business, um, and we lost two, we had oil debriefings. They were very, very good. So I give uh, Department of Interior and Secret Service just major kudos. They sat down with us, they went over what we had done. They encouraged us to bid again in three years later, and on both of them we won the big mm -hmm. We won it the second time. And it made so much, it was a very trusting relationship we learned from it. So, you know, I'm definitely in favor of oil debriefs. Um, we, we've had others as well, too, where it wasn't so much that, but the trust goes both ways, and it was a great, great relationship, so I just want to give kudos to that. Right. I, mean, I mean, there are real limitations on what you can find out in a debriefing. Um, you can find out a lot about your own evaluation. Right. You can find out, you can't really find out as much about the awardee. Yeah. And, the, and the contracting officer could say, you know, there were strengths in the awardee's proposal that I can't tell you about that I thought were worth the price premium. Um, and stop right there. Um, I mean, they could be as they could they could give you as much as they can, but you could still leave unsatisfied. And that sort of leads to our next staged question, and that is, and this is for the panel, for any one of you, um, is there a relationship? I know we've, we've addressed it briefly between a a good or a bad debriefing and the likelihood of a subsequent protest. Anyone? I'm I think um, if, if it's bad, it's very difficult. It, it, you know, you go through the scenario that we played out, you know, the discussions in terms of are we going to protest because we don't have enough information. I think most companies don't want to protest today. It costs a lot of money. There is a little bit of a stigma to it. You're very concerned about the relationship with the customer. So I think most companies that I've uh, worked with don't want to don't want to protest. But there are some times when you feel like you look at the outside and you see who the awardee is and you know of their own experiences and their past performances and that type of thing and it's a struggle to understand as a company why you didn't match up to them. And so unless the government really says, this is what you didn't do, this is what you didn't show us, it, it is very challenging for companies to, to go through that and make that decision. And I, I, I think a part of that is preparation. We, we kind of jested about it in the skit. but. Really, preparation for a debrief uh, needs to happen in order for it to be effective. Uh, that's all I'll say. Okay. Um, what do you guys think about debriefing the winning offer? Is that a common practice? Should it be done? Is there value in it? I think there's value in it. Um, you know, typically what, what you see is you send out the, the letters. Um, maybe with a little bit more detail than your letter that you got. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you invite um, the unsuccessful offers to request the debrief and tell them you know, when they need to request it by. Um, and 
typically you debrief them first. Um, you have, um, what I've seen happen is with the successful offering, I, I, I wouldn't typically call it a debriefing, but when we have a kickoff meeting as a part of that meeting, then we'll have a conversation about their proposal of what we found, what we saw were uh, some, what we consider to be excellent. But we, and there could be some errors where they didn't get, they weren't rated the highest, and, and just share that information with them because that helps them when they um, propose on other requirements. In fact, I, I think from the, go ahead. From, from an industry standpoint, it's, it's just as important as when you lose because you still want to know what you did well and what you didn't do so well. And typically, the contracting office is more open with you because there's less on protest. <laughs> so they're willing to share more of that and give you a little more insight. You want to, you really do want to know. It's a great opportunity to find out, well, that really worked. And, and sometimes you go a little deeper. Did you like the way I laid that table out? Explain that not everybody will do that, but sometimes you can get more of a deeper now, level. Now, Lisa hit this in skit too, but uh, what role does your major subcontractor play um, if for the corporate folks here in, in the consideration of debriefings or protests? In terms of if they're involved or? If they're involved in them or, or we sort of implied in the skit that you might get some pressure. You know, typically it depends on how many people you can have attend. And there's usually a limit to how many people can attend a debrief. And typically if it's three or even five, um, normally it's not enough to bring a subcontractor into it. And there are some um, areas where as a prime, you don't necessarily want your subs to know, like your pricing, you know, things that are very sensitive. But uh, every once in a while if you have a, subcontractor that is a very strategic partner, you, you may want to bring one of their executives or someone to the table. And, and again, in the, in the skit, we, uh, we joked about whether or not council should participate in the debriefing. So maybe from a government and a, and a uh, contractor perspective, what are your thoughts on involving council in the oral debriefing? Well, I'll take it from the government perspective. Um, it, we asked the offerers to give us a list of attendees, and if they include council, we don't prohibit council, we, we invite our council to attend. Uh, if they give me a list, uh, I have canceled a debriefing. If they have given me a list and council was not on there and council shows up, I've canceled a debriefing. I said, we need to reschedule because I need my council in the room as well. So I don't, it, it becomes, um, Sometimes I think, I, I, in that instance, it was an intimidation factor. They, it was kind of a, uh, we're bringing counsel, but I think they were shocked when I said, well, debriefing is over, and we'll have to come back. <laughs> uh, especially, especially in that instance, they flew in from California for that debriefing. And so we had to reschedule it because um, they intentionally didn't tell us they were bringing counsel. I don't have a problem with counsel attending, I just need to know because, um, my council needs to attend. And from a well, private sector perspective? You know, from industry, I'm in business development, that actually is my real job. Um, and in business development, you don't usually like the lawyers around. I mean, it just, it stifles the discussion, it stifles, you know, the, my goal would be to get as much information to help me next time. That, that's really my goal. What did I really not do well? What do we need to improve? You know, just what you were saying. Where can we improve for next time? Because we do want to do business with that customer again. So I think bringing, at least from my perspective, bringing legal, the only reason you would do it if you really knew you were going into a protest and thought you didn't. So that was my follow-up question. Is there a signal that government and industry sees in the presence of council? Everybody's more tense when council attends. <laughs> Everybody knows it's uh, more likely that something else could happen we could get to the protest stage. It's a lot less likely, a lot, uh, I don't know if friendly was the right word, but more comfortable. Okay. Right. And yes, sir. From uh, Do you have my sheet? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a camera back here? <laughs> all right. Excellent point. Uh, great minds think alike. I wish I thought of the question and I actually did. So it's the thought about recording uh, the debriefing. And uh, so, so our thoughts, maybe from a government and contractor perspective, on recording them and, and how you document them and then what you release. Any, any thoughts? I, I, I know from my opinion, I, 
I'm a little hesitant about the recording. I'm a little camera shy, even though I know I was up here. And, uh, <laughs> you're, um, you're a star in the making. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are boxes. Yeah, there are boxes. But I think whenever you you put the camera in play, or you, it, it just sends a signal that you know you want to make sure somebody's on record for what they said, and that is going to definitely put the government in a situation where they're going to be. Would a, would a stenographer be the same kind of thing, or the camera is different? No. Yeah, I mean, what you can take notes. That's one thing, you know, obviously. But somebody that's taking word for word that could be used for, you know. Some well, let, let me go right to Lou because you mentioned earlier that the actual debriefing doesn't have as much weight as maybe we thought it did. So, does the presence of a recording or a stenographer play a role in your in your world? No, I've never, I've never, and any of the protests assigned to me um, had a situation where there had been a recorded debriefing. Um, oral presentations, sure, um, but not a recorded debriefing. What we would, what we would be concerned about is, does the contemporaneous record support the agency's evaluation and award decision? I don't, I say I don't really care, but well, I, I, use that record, as a I use it as a shorthand for meaning it's not relevant. And, that, and I, I slip into that. It, is, it isn't relevant, really, if what is said in the debriefing is accurate or inaccurate. Now, it might be the cause of a protest, but it would not be the reason for sustaining it. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. yes ma'am. Um, as far as knowledge management, you know, whether you're government or industry, how are you looping back in what you learn when there's a protest or what you learn from a debriefing? <laughs> We, industry typically does a lessons learned session. I mean, we usually do them whether we win or lose. Um, some companies are better than others about actually documenting that and putting it into a database so that the next time you do either a similar bid or a bid for that customer, you go pull that information and say, okay, we really messed up here. We want to focus on doing a better job. So that's from an industry perspective typically what we do. Well, I can tell you um, what I do every two weeks. Um, I, I receive in a report every two weeks on every um, protest that is in the Federal Acquisition Service. And I take a look, my staff takes a look at that, and if we see some systemic issues that are across, let's say, two or three regions, then we look back into those regions and say, look, you, we've seen this issue you know, across these regions. How can we help you with whatever this issue is? Maybe, maybe they have an issue with sh should the past performance be neutral or should it be good or, or excellent, whatever, whatever it may be. So we, we look back in then. And then when I was in the operational side, the team itself kind of had its own internal debriefing. What have we done? What could we do better? How can we improve on the next one so that as, as we move forward, um, we don't make if we did some of those same mistakes, or we improve on what, on what we have, we may have a brown bag session to kind of help the entire organization uh, on learning how we did that procurement. Now, some procurements we don't want to talk about anymore, and we have no discussion about. But for the most part, that's what you see. Yes, sir. So there's a there's a type of protest we haven't really talked about. We talked about the scenario of a company who didn't win, wants to find out why, who they think they they ought to have won, something like that. There's the other scenario where the company didn't win, they know why, they don't really doubt the integrity of procurement, but they're an incumbent and they can buy themselves a 100-day in the lease extension. So are there any ideas about you know, what can be done? I mean, the only thing that's going to prevent that is if the protest is dismissed. You know, the GAO doesn't take the case. What can be done to raise the bar and what GAO might take or something in the debrief that could help make it so ironclad that that they can't you know, buy themselves that, that extension? I'll respond. One thought is, we, we tried to address part of that. You heard us say in the skit that one of the losing offers was the incumbent. And we also addressed it from the sense that it costs. You know, our CEO, Frida, talked about the cost of, of hiring counsel to do that. Uh, I think from a government perspective, our hope would be that we have a strong enough relationship with our incumbent, notwithstanding the fact that they lost, that they would view that as a waste of resources because they're only going to get, let's say, 100 days, especially in your scenario that it's ironclad. But I think this is a question maybe best answered by Lou. I think um, on the so, side, for a big but, program, it pays for itself. 
I mean, we don't look at motivation. We don't. We look at the merits of the protest. Um, if there's some procedural defect in the protest, we'll try to dismiss it, especially if the, uh, you know, the intervener or the agency raises it right away. If there's some procedural reason to dismiss it, then we would dismiss it. If not, then we're going to develop it and, and on the merits and determine if there's any merit to any of the issues raised. But we don't look at motivation. We don't try to parse that or try to decipher. And I actually find it very interesting if somebody actually, you know, if companies do that, because the way it sours the relationship with the program office, I, I find stunning when when folks do that for a hundred days. Okay, any other questions? Maybe please. No one from that section over here has <laughs> questions, so we're coming to you next of this gentleman here. So in the IT services world today, pretty much the most common reason for losing is price. And you go into a debrief and really all you're going to find out is what the winning price was compared to your price. And of course the number one question on your mind, especially nowadays you find price that is half of what you did. People are really going well on these things. And the question on your mind is what kind of cost realism did the government do? What kind of independent cost, you know, government cost estimate was there? Mm -hmm. is there is there anything the government can do to, because that's, that's really, when you walk out of there, you're really frustrated because you get no information and you say, the winning bidder can't do it for that price. Is there anything the government can do to give you more information that would stop you from thinking that way? Those some thoughts. Okay, I mean, it, it would depend if we're talking cost or price. I mean, um, Best value kind of thing. Sure, but I mean, are we talking a cost reimbursement contract or are we talking a fixed price type contract? And if it's a fixed price contract, then the contract type essentially protects the government's cost position. You know, the cost to the government is contractually protected. Um, and then the, there's a different type of evaluation that the government's required to do. When you mention cost realism, I guess you're talking a cost reimbursement type contract. Um, and in a, in, a, in a cost reimbursement type contract, then the government has to do a different type of, uh, you know, analysis. And uh, I believe you can tell somebody in a debriefing the awardee's proposed cost and evaluated cost. Yes. So you would know whether or not you know you think that they they came in really low and, and maybe the government actually made adjustments um, and that the evaluated cost on which the award decision was made differs some a little a lot from the offeror's proposed cost. Can I touch on that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I evaluated a proposal several, several years ago, pre-GSA, and um, the successful offer, uh, the winning proposal, I think was maybe $1.2 billion. Um, the next contractor was at $2.5 billion. So it's the same situation. <laughs> and, and so when we debrief the unsuccessful offer, that was their question. There's no way they can do it for that. You know, we're doing this, and this and this contract was was in theater in Iraq, and and so we had to explain to them the correlation between their price and why their proposal received weaknesses. And one of the main reasons was they were um, they had developed um, a proposal that aligned their personnel with the troops that were in theater, where there was no way the government could ship all of those people to theater and manage them. So we couldn't accept their, there's just no way we could do it. You can't, I can't have one for one. I can't have um, contractors traveling with the troops. I mean, it was what they wanted to do, if we could do it, it would have been outstanding, but we couldn't do it. So we had to explain to them why that 2.5 billion, what the relationship of what their proposal was to that 2.5 billion and why the government just could not uh, take that that offer and so hopefully it, um, when people are debriefed they can give you that that type of information okay any questions from the far right you've been quiet <laughs> you're gonna put you on the spot no okay I, I only have one more really final question it's a question for you folks and um, I hopefully someone will step up and give us some response but we've tried to describe to you uh, the thought process that goes into a debriefing and some of the things that we see as risks and, and hopes that we get out of it 
from both both sides of the perspective. So my qu summary question is: Does is there a relationship between a debriefing and the decision to protest? And that's an open question to you. Uh, I'd love for someone to stand up and, and give us your thought, and then we'll react to that. So this is your this is our time to ask you a question and let and let us react. So. Is there a relationship between the debriefing and your decision to protest or, or not? So we'll go over here from the right. I'll give you my opinion. I, I say yes, because if you get what you feel is an inadequate debriefing or no debriefing, you've asked for something and you don't get something, or perhaps you ask for a debriefing and they schedule it for the week after the protest time, frame runs out. Chances are you're probably going to get a protest. And all you government guys in here, it's amazing what you can find and discover when you start looking through the government's documents. <clears throat> so, word to the wise, please give a protest. I may not give a protest. <laughs> 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 I'm going to override that. I'm not going to slip. No, I'm not an attorney. Um, <laughs> <laughs> If you can give, I don't care whether you call it a debriefing or some sort of unofficial information about why the vendor lost, I, I personally think that if you do it, you can give honest information and provide good, good information on why they lost, didn't meet the requirements, you're going to do yourself a favor in the long run. Are you going to avoid all protests? No. But are you going to avoid some? I, I would say yes. Thank you. And there was a hand up right in here. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Jared Townsend with Deloitte. So I'll, I'll offer that, just from our perspective, there's not a, a tried and true relationship between the two. A good degree doesn't result in no protests, and a bad degree doesn't result in protests. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of more factors. The relationship with the customer today, the desired relationship with the customer in the future, those are the two primary ones. Uh, the next one is really around, well, what is it we thought that we, we, we know where our, our own strengths and weaknesses are. And the debrief is really a lot of times just to justify so our learning is better. Or we learn something new we didn't know. The decision to protest is, is very far down the line. It has to do with, do we think there was something un, un, unjustifiable? in the way the, the process works. Not necessarily unfair, life isn't fair, it's just a matter of, is there something that is, is that the government's gonna lose if, if we don't speak up? So it's really, the, the, pro, the debrief is very helpful, but at least in the situations I've been, it doesn't really drive the, the decision. Any other thoughts about that? Yes, sir. I believe that the case is that, let's say a local contractor sitting there and really is offered with the lowest but he hasn't been selected. And on a debriefing he gets the information not really how he sees his team compared to the winning team. And knowing also the fact that he was the lowest, he hasn't been selected, but he cannot get the information how strong the other team was and all. And then we don't do a good debriefing there, that really might answer in the trial of process. So I think I've heard two answers that say a poor debriefing or no debriefing could encourage the kind of fishing expedition that, that Lou referenced in part of his answer that isn't really considered in, in, the, in the GAO process, but it certainly puts all of us on in, in, the, in the team, both, both internally and externally through. You know, the bottom line is that was not the investigation, the evaluation was not an identified out. GAO will say, oh, by the way, here is something you didn't look at this and go back and reevaluate it. That's what it takes. I mean, then you find something else during discovery that you didn't, it has nothing to do with the debriefing, but yeah, it's a loophole sure. here for GAO to say, you know, go back and do another evaluation. We don't like those loopholes. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anything, any other thought over? Yes, sir. I think many of the things that would trigger a protest you, you see before the debrief, but if you're dealing with an agency over a period of time, one that gives you a very complete debrief is extending, it's showing its confidence in its process. It's, it shows, look, we, we're confident we did this right. We're happy to share as much as we can. 
when you deal with an agency that continually says, I'm not going to tell you anything, what they're signaling is, we are pretty confident we would lose if you protested. So therefore, we have to share as little as possible because we don't think our people followed the procedures. And what that does is encourage people to think, in a future one, maybe we should, because they seem to have very little confidence in their own explanation of why they made the choice. So part of the deep ribbing is a statement of confidence in the government. We know we did it right. Here's why, and here's the explanation. Interesting perspective. The one thing I'd, I'd ask if we get a chance before close is, sure. if you don't intend to protest, what can you say to the government folks, aside from leaving the guns at the door and not bringing the lawyer, <laughs> to say, look, all I really want to do is know how to do better, because you know, I've been on the government side of the course side, but you can tell the difference in the room when the government guys are spooked, and they say nothing useful. And the, you know, the best debrief I got was one where we didn't submit a final proposal at a certain point, and they knew we couldn't protest, so we got great information. <laughs> do that in the future, but if, from the government perspective, if somebody really just wants the information, there's no interest in protesting, how do they signal that to you to make you as open about giving them information as possible? Thoughts from our government folks? Well, believe it or not, the government actually wants information from you guys as well to help improve our processes. Um, so. I, I feel that industry actually is, I, I'm stunned, stunned again, that they're uh, tight-lipped at times in debriefs, in giving information, like they're gonna offend us even if they weren't the awardee, you know? How could they, how could they offend us anymore? So, I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, I like to say, think that, that debriefings are the perfect opportunity for us to increase competition on both sides. Um, you know, we learn how to make proposal um, RFPs better, or even our requirements, or that little thing that we put in our requirements that maybe we really didn't need, but it made the cost, you know, go crazy. And and you guys learn how to make your proposals actually be better, you know, read like we feel like they should be read. And so the next time, whenever you submit your proposal, you're going to submit a better proposal because we were honest with you during the debrief and we give you a better RFP because you told us that last time that page count, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, the fact that we put out put it out on December 23rd, you know, don't be so mean, right? <laughs> but I'll bring up a comment to that because it spawns a whole nother discussion, which is can the government actually do a casualty, I'll call it a casualty, after the protest period so that you can actually get real information and, and everyone's guard would be down at that point. All right, Lou, Lou's got a reaction to that. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, our council is upset now, so we got to go. <laughs> That's why I don't care about the to that. I mean, first you can, no. your first response is you can file your protest. Your protest to be timely is 10 days from when you knew of your reason for protest. Okay. They delayed the debriefing three or four weeks, and then they gave it to you, and you heard things at the debriefing that you, you know, caused red flags to go up, then you you can still timely file a protest. Well, what if you, they did the, all the debriefings, and then a month later, you're able to go back and get information? Is that possible? <laughs> Do a second well, debriefing? Well, I, I, I think if I can interpret Lou's question is, if, if information is subsequently provided, that would cause the company to throw a red flag. The fact that it was on the second or the third or the fourth debriefing is not still doesn't include. Is that correct? Right. Or, or if it's not called a debriefing, right, like right, 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 exactly. and you receive information, still. then they still have the opportunity. Yes, sir. The one other thing is there are many procurements out there where offers are not entitled to a debrief. I mean, you could do a simplified acquisition. You're, you're not entitled to a debriefing. Debriefing is a part, part 15 type concept. You can do a schedule by an FSS task order of any size, and the guidance in the FAR, or the, the, the requirement in the FAR, not just guidance, is the, their offer is entitled to a brief explanation. And some contracting officers take that very literally. I gave them a brief explanation before coming in. Um, I don't know why FSS task orders over five million aren't worth the same as IDIQ task orders over five million. And, but right now, there is no debriefing requirement for FSS task orders of any sense. I'll take a stab at answering part of your question as well. Uh, in one of my former roles, I think it goes back to, uh, you don't really have a relationship with contractors, but I think someone on the panel said trust. Um, I was um, a, a director of a shop, and we had a long-standing you know, contract, uh, and they lost. Um, and 
the guy called me up and said, we're not going to protest. I want to bring my CEO in. He wants to know why we lost. And there will be no, you know, I frankly trusted him. And, and Lou's correct. I knew when we had that conversation that if we disclosed information that was, you know, first time heard in red flag material, that they legally could protest. But we had a multi-year relationship with them. We had multi-contracts with them. We knew they weren't going to go away. Um, and I trusted that they just wanted, you know, the, the, the down and dirty. If, if, the, if somebody in our skit said that was stupid, you know, and the, the thing we're not allowed to say that, but we said it. And we said that this just was way off track. And they appreciated that. They didn't protest. They went on. It, it is, as Lou said, you know, you're, you're taking the risk because if somebody says something in there, the company can throw the red flag. Yes, sir. Yeah, follow on to the, the issue of the timeliness of a protest. Um, doesn't GAO have the ability to consider a protest notwithstanding the timeliness? <laughs> yes. Okay, here we go. <laughs> you don't like that answer. Here we, here we go. If what you're challenging is a solicitation defect, those protests, if they're going to file it at GAO, have to be filed before closing. Everything else is 10 days from when you knew or should have known of your reason for protest. Their GAO does have the ability, timeliness is a GAO rule, it's not a statutory rule. Um, we do have the ability to do, to find something to be a significant issue and consider it even if the protest is untimely. No offerer, no protester should ever count on that. That happens once every 10 years. I think I saw a hand start to go up right in top. Two, yes sir, right up front. Right here, yes. In the example uh, in your skit, the uh, contract was for a large amount, presumably the purchase of something that you wouldn't be purchasing again and again. Um, but in smaller procurements, when you're purchasing like things over and over again, um, I would think, and I'd like the panel's feedback, that by giving a debrief, you would basically be teaching the test I, mean, I don't want to give feedback on tables and things like that, but I, I don't want to teach the, uh, the bidders how to make a nice proposal. I, I, I want them to be responsive. I can help them. So is it, is it less desirable when you're uh, doing repeat contracts to ha have a, um, a debrief? Or um, should that only be for larger procurement? Okay. We'll take the government side on that first. Well, I guess I, I, I'm a little confused by your question because I think that um, I would always want to assume that the proposal you're going to give me is something that I really want and that I need. And so the more information that I give you about what it is I really want and I really need, then the next time that's what you will give me as opposed to something I don't want and don't need. So I don't know that it's necessarily teaching the test. It's, it's just making sure that we get across what it is that we're wanting. Um, is, is that answer? I don't know. So. Yes, sir. Well, and, and we've oh, all sorry. read outstanding proposals, and we've all read proposals where we're saying, did they propose the right solicitation? Yeah. Because it's just so off. Uh, I mean, I've I've sat through the oral, oral presentations, and I'm and I'm flipping through the solicitation, going, are they proposed? Did they see the guidelines? And I've sat through proposals. I wanted to stand up and give them a standing ovation because it was just that fabulous, meeting the criteria that were within. So I think from from our perspective. It's, it's better for us to debrief you and give you the information you need so that we receive back what we want so that we can um, we can have those proposals that meet our solicitation. We, we, we want to help you give us the And, and all that in that, that uh, if you watch it over a period of time, really the best companies will learn from that debriefing and you will see the quality of their proposals get better and better. And conversely, those agencies, those contracting officers, and I've seen some that, that start off and they're, they're pretty shaky after, if, if they're good and they get good feedback, both from the company and their, their management, let's say, uh, they get better and better at it as well. Uh, I mean, ideally, we'd love to get to the point, I think, where we get four really, really great offers and you make the choice really, really hard for us. Uh, that would be better than having one really good offer and three lousy offers, because then we're sort of stuck and we, 
we, we assume they're the best, but I'd, I'd love to have a competition. All right, are we getting close on time? Okay, so, all right, we have three questions, one, two, three, and then we're gonna call it. Yes, sir. How about if you have a pre-award briefing? A pre-award briefing? Yes, before you make the award, have a presentation. Like a down select? Okay, like a, like a competitive range, and then a debriefing? Yes. Okay. Oh, so we have, we have got to the point of, of knowing we're going to send it to ACME, but we haven't announced the award. So we have a debriefing beforehand. Panel? Is that common? Is it worthwhile? I've never done that. I've never done that. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. In the back. I work for the government, and um, honestly, some of the the worst proposals we get are from incumbents. They assume the scope of work. They assume they know what we want. They they just go, well, I'm going to do what I've always done. So if you're the incumbent, I, I really encourage you to read the scope of work. Make sure you read the evaluation factors. Don't make assumptions. Um, assume that we don't know you. Um, because we have to review your proposal along with everybody else on an even playing field. So that, that's just my one. I think we probably, I don't, I don't want to speak for council, but um, probably get a lot of protests from incumbents because I've, I've done it and I had all the experience, my past performance is there, but you have to write your proposal as though we don't know you. And then, then we have one more question here. Yes, sir. Uh, government side as well, and I would echo some of your comments here. I have read proposals that were pretty obvious. Uh, we worked on it over the weekend. And, uh, <laughs> the open period was at least 60 days. And then also read uh, proposals that were just outstanding. Uh, and the debriefs uh, were done well. And the, um, the, in this case, it was a losing incumbent. This is a large dollar value acquisition for them as part of their uh, portfolio. So we gave them a very prepared and you know, focused debrief on what specific areas in their technical proposal that they need to improve. So they took it to heart, and uh, six months later, we had another major acquisition, and then they ended up coming in and doing <coughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up now. I want to thank first Tanaj. She did a great job in coordinating our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Embarrassed to make you stand. But. <laughs> uh, I thank our panel, especially the folks who took on the roles of our Swedish uh, government and corporate counterparts over the